so much, Jenny. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so I just want to begin by saying, um, yeah, that I'm really happy and excited to be reading tonight with you all. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to hearing Yvette, Jenny and Agnieszka read as well tonight. Um, yeah, thank you, Jenny, for all the brilliant work that you do and organising this excellent series. Um, so I'm going to read three poems. Um, so my first poem is from my pamphlet Kismet um, and it's an elegy for my maternal grandmother um, and this poem I guess is an attempt to express what is not possible for me to express um, in my original mother tongue, um, Chinese, um, and it's addressed to my mother. A prayer for my grandmother. Mother, let us enfold our griefs in lotus leaves, cast them in the vagaries of the river. Let its alchemy bloom the most enchanting flower in the murkiest of waters. Let us admit how ghosts can resurrect themselves, become our holy guardians who watch over us as we sleep. Mother, let us remember how our women were once warriors, unbeholden to any man, how the world was not made by a god, but a goddess who created the earth from mud. She held up the sky with the legs of a giant tortoise, allowing every star to shine its light, the sun to burst forth, the lovely moon to come out at night. Let us remember that grandmother's name means spring beauty. Um. So my next poem is um, a more recently written piece, um, which was published last year in the White Review. Um, and it's a long two part hybrid prose poem piece. Um, and it's inspired by my family history. Um, you know, I write a lot about my family. Um, and it also responds in part to the work of Julia Kristeva, um, who I've been reading a lot of um, over the last few years, particularly um, in my PhD research. So the title of the poem is about Chinese women, um, which is taken from um, Kristeva's 1974 text of the same name. Um, and this poem begins with a quotation from Kristeva, which reads, suicide without a cause or silent sacrifice for an apparent cause, which in our age is usually political. A woman can carry off such things without tragedy, without even drama. About Chinese women. One, I return to a former self, ghost or shadow self, emerging from a glimmering light. Wolf's luminous halo, a semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end. Life as circularity, inevitable return to a womb-like space, a space of the maternal. Where do the dead go after they die? What nether region do they inhabit? Where did the Hakka people come from? Peripatetic tribe from northeast China. She comes from people without a home or fixed position. She is condemned and doomed to wander, looking for her place in history. I conjure up the past delving into the recesses of unknown memory and time. I'm returning to the source, the original source, the point of all our origin. But these origins go further back beyond Western tradition 
beyond the story of holy innocence fabricated in the myths of Adam and Eve and the notion of a God the Father. And it does not reside in the maternal womb either, that place of warmth and nurturance which begins with love. I invite mystery. I return to our innate energy, excavating deeply, layer upon layer of our consciousness. I breathe in the light. I inhale deeply and exhale. Where is the point of our origin? I am digging deep. I have to go further than the surface of things, back through space and time. I uncover hidden treasure buried for centuries and carefully retrieve it for future purposes. Filtering through the coloured papers of memory, those delicate, fragile and carefully processed pieces of our past and history felt in my bones and body. In the beginning there was the word, and the word is me. My words become me and I become the word, a flurry of mixed phrases, half-spoken sentences, articulate in their gibberish. I try to find the language that defines me, become a whirling dervish caught up in a veil of spinning letters. They fly around me and I try to catch them. In the beginning there was the word. I am the signifier, the signified, signifying everything and nothing. Once I danced myself into a trance to find my grandmother's spirit. When I felt it, my body shattered into tiny fragments. Syncope, an absence of the self, time faltering, head spinning with a sudden vertigo. Silent grandmother, guardian of secrets, please speak to me. And when the repressed return to reclaim themselves, it will be terrifying. Two, a black and white family photograph taken in Hong Kong. The year is 1957 or 1958. My mother doesn't know exactly. There are three generations of Hakka people in the photograph. My grandparents, their children, my grandfather's brother and his family, and my great grandmother. Hakka means guest families nomadic migrants renowned for their fortitude and resilience. In the 19th century, in clan wars against the Punti people, they built walled villages to protect themselves. My mother tells me how hard they worked all day in the fields, growing rice, sweet potatoes, yams. There was no gas, no paraffin. They worked under the sun all day until it went dark. They sold their crops. The name of the area they lived in was Kukpo. It was inhabited by seven clans, Sung, Li, Ho, Dang, Cheng, Ing and Yung. Today, Kukpo is an abandoned village inhabited by many ghosts. The town borders the frontier closed area. Three women sit in the middle of the photograph. In the centre, the matriarch, my great grandmother sits. In front of her, she parades her favourite grandson, my uncle. On her mother's lap, my mother is a toddler, looking at the camera with bewildered eyes. My grandfather, who I hardly know, stands as a young, handsome man. My grandmother gazes at the camera with seemingly sad eyes, but she is difficult to read. Is she angry, troubled, distrustful, resentful? What is it that flickers beneath the surface, caught in this singular moment? I can see my aunt's features in my grandmother, her big round eyes, her wide nose and full lips. All the women are dressed in dark clothes, the men in white shirts, the children in a mixture of traditional dress and western clothes. And what I find interesting about the photo is that the women are placed in the middle. No one is smiling, even the children look sombre. It's as though someone has died. And someone will die two or three years after this photograph is taken. My grandmother, she will take her own life and leave her children behind. An eternal mystery, unreadable cipher. From generation to generation, an irretrievable grief, an irrevocable loss reverberates. 
My mother will become motherless at the age of three or four. She will inherit a wicked stepmother, but earn the guilt-stricken love of her grandmother, trying to make amends for her sins. My mother tells me how her grandfather, how her grandmother really loved her and saved an apple only for her every day. No one else had an apple, only me. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Do you remember her, Mammy? What was she like? Like you, I remember many things from childhood. I can still remember seeing her foaming at the mouth after she drank the weed killer. I think she mustn't have drunk very much because she could still walk home back to the village. They tried to ferry her across the harbour to the city, but it was too late. Of course, she died. Her body lies somewhere in an unmarked grave on the beach in Santau. No one knows where she is buried. In recent years, my aunt bought a shrine for her in a cemetery in Hong Kong. And I'll end with the final poem in my pamphlet, Kismet, um, which is called Love Token. If anything, I'm a witchy vagrant, locked inside an endless hall of mirrors, patterns and repetitions, wandering. I've often been in the wrong place at the wrong time, my wasted youth traded for a ghostly ride in a fairground, crazy merry-go-round music haunting my memories. Family, friends, ancestors and spirits light a candle when I'm gone so the pretty moths can come closer to the flame but not be burned. I don't want to go just yet. The moon is so elegant tonight. All week long, shitstorms and hailstones raged. Thank you for the damned and wild beauty you have given me here. Though most days, I couldn't find the words to tell you. The way a Chopin nocturne plays inside my head every time I think of you. It remains unknown. I smash through the glass. I leave you the key. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, um, Jenny, uh, Jennifer, um, <laughs> for, um, for such wonderful poems. And um, like some of them, they just, you know, um, they are newer works, I believe, and um, it just makes us think so much about, um, you know, like uh, people or women uh, across time and space and how you manage to blend in, as you can see later on the chat, we've been talking about how, you know, you have brought out so many different sides of womanhood and the sort of um, history and uh, the legends or myths um, and um, they're just so beautiful and um, full, so informed also of by many different um, resort, like sources or texts and um, stories. So um, I, I, I don't want to start <laughs> talking otherwise I, I will not be able to continue um, until a while like, later. So, but it's just really, um, what's a wonderful treat to be, hear these and uh, thank you very much. So um, we would like to now, uh, you know, um, first also introduce our second reader, um, Yvette, Yvette Sidjet. Um, I hope I haven't mispronounced your surname. But um, so uh, Yvette is the author of Atmospheric Ghost Light, selected by Monica Young for the 2021 Poetry Society of America Chapbook Award. Um, her debut collection, a winner of the inaugural of the James Berry Poetry Prize will be published by Blood Axe in 2023. Her work has also received support from um, various places, Library Poetry Critics, Canto Mundo, Macondo, Brett Loaf, Arts Council, National Endowment for the Arts and Visible Communities Programme of National Center for Writing. Um, her translation of Alexandra Pizarnik's uh, late work, Extracting the Stone of Madness, Poems, uh, won the Best Translated Book Award 
um, and uh, she's currently reading uh, for a PhD in Spanish um, American literature at Merton in Oxford. Um, so I'd like to welcome Yvette to um, read to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me to read this evening. I am in a new house uh, in a new city here in Birmingham, um, which means an entirely different Zoom background, but also the sense of loneliness that I find is truly mitigated um, by sharing this beautiful space with you. So it's lovely to see how our poetry community is everywhere. And I'm grateful for the voices that this series has brought together. Um, the first piece I will read is written in the voice of an infant sister of mine who died before I was born and uh, whose name I inherited. It's a kind of rewriting of the opening lines of the Iliad, but it's set in Los Angeles where I'm from and it takes place right before the eruption of the civil war in El Salvador, uh, which is where my mother is from. The war uh, is, is one of the threads that tie together my, my debut collection. The Valley Girls. Los Angeles, late summer, 1979. The Santa Anas singe the valley. All year I wait for winter to be born. I hold my unformed lungs up to the light, airless heat, the fading fractal tracheal buds cramp like bonsai, blotching in a satin box. To name me was to name you without knowing, like Theo, male ordering holy water from the Jordan to make me little evening well. There will always be too much wonder, too much work to do. Sing, my strong grieved sister of the wrath of this long summer. Sing for me, sing me. And this next poem is addressed to the speaker of the poem I just read. Uh, it begins to explore my personal experience of being what's known as a replacement child, which is a, a term from psychology referring to a child who was conceived shortly after the parents have lost another. Uh, examples of this from history are Vincent van Gogh and Stendhal, for example. And one more thing to note is that the title refers to the Spanish term for the Beatitudes from the Gospels, uh, and, and these are a set of blessings articulated by Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. Bienaventuranza. Because in sleep I call you blank. Because a cluster of jasmine was surrounded by seawater in the smallest nook of the evening. Because there was an archer and a storm that felled a yew tree and a grid of blessings beneath them. Once there were stars for this, charts of flat anxieties filling the telescopic dark. Because our sisters vined together like brittle coral halves. Because our mother mistook the gardenia, her favorite flower, and Freud's, it seems, for a rose. Because first she carried a broken city. Because our grandmother was named after the evangelist as our great-grandmothers were the namesakes of lamentation. Because your lungs were shaped in the bureaucratic hum of mourning. Do you know what mourning is? Because it is full of ancient trees here. Because the blonde woman in the time machine who loved our father once describes a people without a history. Because our name could make us from here. Because on the day you were born, our mother saw an archangel in the window, and the year you were born, the hands of her sister were left in a sky-lit room. Because there was a war between them, because that war was in you. Mo sote, the will-o'-the-wisps, you know, something of this, the jack-o'-lanterns, the night birds. Because one day, our mother's brother raced along the highway pursued by that ever elusive archangel crying out, blessed are the pure in heart. Dear blessed, dear curling cork of lightning, 
I'm thinking of a number between not and God and wish you'd tell me. The poet James Berry said that poetry is a form of music that stirs connections. Um, this next piece, which is the longest that I'll be uh, performing this evening, is a cento uh, that's made up of lines by writers uh, that I look up to. It's about how we write a translation. So every section that you'll hear uh, numbered uh, is a kind of attempt to capture the way, through the language of others, capture the way that the mind tries to make sense of language in one language, of text in one language and bring it over into the language um, of another poetic tradition. Uh, and this, the, the, the text that I'm working with as the source is, um, it's a Latin American song. It's like a classic song from the forties called Muñequita Linda. And it's a piece that my father used to sing to me as a lullaby and that my grandfather used to sing to my grandmother as a love song. So it's a very uh, polyvalent piece. And the cento, for those of you who might be interested in knowing who I'm borrowing text from, is comprised entirely of lines by the composer, um, Maria Graver, as well as the poets uh, Ada Limon, uh, Gloria Ansaldúa, uh, Toni Morrison, Alejandra Pizarnik, in my translation, um, Claribel Alegría, V.C. Andrews, André Breton, Sandra Maria Esteves, Aracelis Girmey, uh, Julian del Casal, Dina Gioia, and another centro, uh, which was by Faltonia Betizia Prova, uh, a, a Roman writer. Uh, that's the first woman to write a centro I, that in, in recorded history, and um, that's built on lines by Virgil. So all of these texts reflect on the complexities of sisterhood and or boundaries. And they are written by authors who have helped me think through uh, a central preoccupation of the book um, that I'm working on, which is this idea of the replacement child. I do realize that we're doing closed captioning and that th some of the text you'll hear is obviously in Spanish. So I'm going to just try to pop this Spanish uh, in the, into the chat. And that should go in. Great. Um, so a translation that I'm of, the, of the piece that I'm going to read goes something like this. One, pretty little doll of mine with your golden hair and ruby lips and perfect pearly teeth. Tell me if you love me as much as I love you and if you will remember me as I remember you. At times I hear a holy echo enfolded in the breeze and this is how it speaks. Yes, I love you very, very much, as much as ever and always till I die. So that's the song and it's a long preamble to reading it. Um, but when it appears in the poem, it's one, the lyrics that you see on, on, on the chat, when you hear this, uh, I will sing it for you. So, Sento as translation of Muñequita Linda by Maria Graver. One, muñequita linda. Some days there is a violent sister inside of me. Ella es la luna and she lights up the darkness. She is the moon, ilumina las tinieblas. Por ratos hay una hermana violenta dentro de mí. Ella es la luna and she lights up the darkness. I swallowed her blood right along with my mother's milk. Me tragaba su sangre junto con la leche de mi madre. You are singing in my poem. Tú con tu dulce vida. You and your sweet life. Two. De cabellos de oro, de dientes de perlas, labios de ruí. I now begin my song. Aquí comienzo mi canto. What a city you'll see there, sister, you who are more beloved than the light. The sky can keep its brilliant orbs. I'll stick to opals, diamonds, pearls. Three. 
Dime si me quieres como yo te adoro. Sister, how my dreams terrify me. Kindred spirit, hurry and sprinkle water from the river. No tardes en llegar, hermana. Will you add this story to your stories of history and land and peace? Four. Si de mí te acuerdas como yo de ti. Ghosts stand in the street where we are. She tells her stories. We tell her ours. If I was able to foresee this great grief that I might find all mysteries. Sister, I found a way. Five. Y a veces escucho un eco divino que envuelto en la brisa parece decir. Shadows in the house, the boards of the floors whisper my mother's milk. Hear the house breathe, shadows in the corners and on the stairs, her ghosts. They belong together and differ from one another. A wondrous gift. Six. Si te quiero mucho, 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 mucho. Hear the house breathe. You are singing in, they belong together and differ from one another, like aromatic elements in chemistry. A veces caminan unidos, cambian ideas, y se van separando de nuevo, reorganizando lo viejo. Her ghosts stand in the street where we are. She is the moon, ilumina las tinieblas. Seven. Tanto como entonces, siempre hasta morir. Sister, how my dreams terrify me. A pyre, I thought I had died and that death meant repeating a name forever. No tardes en llegar, hermana muerte. Don't be long, dear sister death. Think of the letters that we write our dead. Hear the house breathe. You are singing. <sighs> this penultimate poem was inspired by Brandon Somme's incredible collection, The Tribute Force, which was out from Nightboat like eight years ago. Uh, it has a double meaning in the title. There's the fake meat sushi roll, uh, which is also a term to describe a way that many Californians stop or don't really stop uh, when they're driving and reach a street intersection. California rule. When I say accent, I don't mean tilde. I mean the valley, I mean bird song, I mean there used to be a war. The moment the light at the intersection changes before the first driver reacts to the right of way and moves. A foothill, harsh and lonely like a matador brandishing a Sunday, that's the night inside the lining of your voice. A corridor becoming your palette carved into the old geometries. Here I want the muscle shell of your off-key mouth, this thing called glossolalia, a mouth the morning after Pentecost, so mother mortar mortal shell. A blank page dictionary, the endless entries for uninhibited, by which you mean uninhabited and going home. The row of strict tract housing, you enter an unlatched door and bump into a couch that mars where the orchid stand would be, and then it dawns on you. You took a wrong turn back there, and now you're confronted with tin cans turned inside out, with a wreck dry shimmer of traffic musing, the gloss on the lull of the 405 below. You say several, and the airport wind turns your skirt into a capsized bell. What I mean is the grief of windshields, the softer webbing between these words. What I mean is the house we lost. Um, thank you again to the organizers and to everyone who came out to read this, to this reading tonight. Um, it's such a pleasure to intermingle my words with those of these poets. Um, the title of this final poem refers to the national bird of El Salvador. Uh, and it's what my grandmother used to call me as a nickname when I was a child. Uh, it's 
for her. Her name was Lucas Evangelista Chicas Velasquez. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice bookend, if you will, to the poem that Jennifer Litsai read just now to her grandmother. So some continuity here. Torogos. I do not know how to sing for you. The poem I am trying to write you cannot exist. You do not speak this language. You cannot read these words. I think in the language you gave me as I think you the language that gives me song. Where are the feet for this verse? Where are its hands? You who know how poignant the body is, give me sheen of turquoise feathers, give me all your colors, give me words to place here and say to myself when I enlist your names at night, not in closed captioning without sound, not in the azure applause of heaven. Here is a basic song. Usted me toma de la mano y me dice, vos niña, pero vos, mi vida. Where is the story here? How do these lines exist? I am singing for you like the soul when it learns a word for itself. Usted me toma de la mano. They say the earth is simple. You say, my love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvette. Um, this is just uh, what a treat to hear you like um, listen to these uh, uh, wonderful work. And um, I was just so touched by your poetry and how it kind of moves in, um, between language and song and um, history and um, people's stories and love. Um, it's just really very rich here. And hope you can go back to see the comments. Um, everyone has been pitching in with it. And um, we're hoping that your book can come out soon so we can actually read it on the page. And um, congratulations also to the award. <coughs> Sorry. And um, so our next reader, um, Jenny Pectin. Um, Jenny, um, she's, uh, she studied uh, uh, English literature at Oxford and has an MA Creative Writing at University of East Anglia. Um, her pamphlet called back um, tells the story of her postnatal psychosis uh, experience, which was published by Iware in 2017 and shortlisted for the Miss Lexia pamphlet competition. Um, and her full collection manuscript in the Snow Globe is now being considered um, by publishers. She won the 2020 Alumna Norwich City Wall Commission and the Cafe Writers Norfolk Prize. And Jenny was also long listed for the Rebecca Swift Foundation Women's Poetry Prize and um, the Second Light Competition. Her work has been featured in many different magazines, including New Welsh Reviews, Smoke, Magma, Ambit, The Stand, Wild Caught, Finnish Creatures, Inks, Sweat and Tears, and Emma Press Anthology for Contemporary Gothic Verse. Um, so welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was lovely introduction. And thank you so much for um, this opportunity to read this evening. And hi to everyone in the audience. It's lovely. It's really lovely to uh, of you to have come and to have your ears. So as Jenny says, um, I've written in Corbeck about postnatal psychosis. And that's also the subject of my manuscript in the snow globe. Um, and that illness is a, a break with shared reality, which is brought about by childbirth, um, which felt to me like kind of walking around in normal life, but so with my eyes open, but dreaming in dream logic. Um, and this evening I'm gonna read deliberately quite a few poems that don't get an outing so often, but I'll start with the title poem of the collection. Snow Globe. All those weeks, the summer waited for me, like a snow globe, around the time I thought I could fly, one of those weeks when I felt elated by the glitter in the floor tiles and my heart and mouth were full of song, feet starry from the seeds and grains, the dust of noon. I was making and remaking the bed twice a day, half lifted on dry flaring storms, but he came only once, upturned my cloistered world. The nurse said, 
it wasn't my fault. Evening dust played in the window while I handed round parsley like Ophelia, thinking she meant the sheets. <clears throat> The next one is a poem called Gore. All our mothers have to buy us a cow's eye. The polythene bags inside the paper ones. Our scalpels slip hungrily, barely snagging on the sclera, choroid, retina. It surprises me, the toughness of optic nerves twisted in lilac, the vitreous like an amniotic sac and how quietly it is. The 28 hearts can go on beating under crested sweaters, despite, despite. When the bounty photographer asks me to dab the blood off you, I hate her. That blood means the hours they made me push you, inwardly whispering, get out. That blood means the hours of the hospital door flipping death and life. It means my grandmother's voice. It means latexed hands lifting you clear of me. And I, who capitulate at every turn and suddenly naked and defiant as my son. And I just will not, will not clean it. The next poem's called Wool Gathering, and that's an old phrase for absent-mindedness that comes from people, um, poor people, picking the wool that's been caught up in the hedgerows and selling it. Um, the other word you may not have come across in this is smitten, which is a glove for two people's hands that a couple can wear together. Okay, wool gathering. February. Outside the cinema, holding hands in our smitten, my coat buttoned only once. It's showing, I'm showing. Learning granny squares to calm my hands down to make this winter bearable. April. Intricate woodland holds the dusk, amber and sapphire over paired back fields. Fleece twists in the barbed wire. Slipping along the jetty on evening walks, you steer me out of my thoughts. May, they have dragged me, cinder down from a pyre, the cot that joins my bed. I watch as my hands learn swaddling. When the midwife comes, I snap. It's not that I can't dress him, it's just that all this knitting fumbles. November, the other mother's inflections intrude on my dreams, yet they ignore my faltering speech, voices bright and glassy. Like living behind a screen, gloved hands at the ATM, trees disconnected in the fog. <coughs> okay, the Selkie or seal folk are humans who can put on a seal skin and change into seals, go into the sea and live there at least part of the time, maybe never coming back. This is a poem in three parts and it's called Selkie Mother. I don't know if anyone else can hear, but there are fireworks just outside my window. Selkie Mother, heart. Winter is the time her heart seeks to wander, wrung out and leaden, drawn with cramps, though she does everything she can to stop it. She tries to tether it with deliveries and concert dates, but still it wants to stray. Every morning, she beaches at 5.15, unprepared and empty-handed, nothing sifted, nothing darned. Winter is the time it would sever itself, float off. She pads about the house in the matted dark. Her heart still longs to snip its ties to her. Womb. Her son had slipped out with the membrane over his scalp. Her womb had stayed behind, an old church, and a church ought not have weather, but this one held ice between its panes, drips in its rafters, buckets at the end of each pew. She watched his small lungs inhale the onion, eyes brimming over with salt. At least he would never drown. Skin. It nestles at the back of the airing cupboard, pressed between tissue like a christening gown. Why would her husband not expect her to find it there? It still fits fine, 
even after pregnancy, the short fur has turned a little clumpy, yellow, tin and grey. All she needs to do is roll it into her bag, run down the damp brown sand, pull the hood over like the baby's crawl, the waves rising over and beneath her. Okay. This comes from something that I saw in the news. Houses. They interviewed a guy on Anglia, the end wall of his terrace blown clean off like a doll's house and all things visible, gym equipment, clothes rails, computer desk, twin divans. He wasn't rich. Tumble dryer, they said. That's how my head feels. Like there's a hole instead of a staircase in the bedroom floor. Like you can peer down through the sitting room ceiling by hanging over the bed, giddy and vertiginous. Or like you might light up all the water in the pipes with potassium screaming at dog whistle that you want to go home. Some of them, some of us, kill our babies. We drive cars into walls or walk off bridges. I want to kiss those women on their foreheads and say, you're not bad, you're not bad, I see you, and you're not a bad person, and fasten all the doors on their broken dolls' houses. In this next one, I was trying to describe the crazy, ineffable confusion of psychosis, but it's also about the burdens and the freedoms of contraception, and it's called Family Planning to Coil Fitting. If it happened again, it would just about finish me off. The nights, the years before they speak, the not knowing what their cries mean, the waiting for all the souls of all my dead to come back as babies in prams and corridors, every wedding ring, name and generation flaming into one. The nurse strips away the packaging, little copper tea bar, an anchor to wedge in the seabed of my body. I cough when she asks me to, and almost smile as my womb clamps down, though the pain is sunset coloured and cloudy, a claret spasm, which makes me think of miscarriage, the seahorse on a towel in the bathroom. And I will bear this too, I will bear it, my fingers feeling the small threads of reassurance. This comes from a time when my son was a little older and I had another episode. Noah and the Catkins. I was sickening for psychosis, more than sickening, and you were less than two, just starting to talk and I made a game for you as we walked the woodland path, putting all the Catkins into houses and to leaves. You tottered about, repeating, pillar, home. Sometimes that is all any of us need, a place to be our home. You took all of your babies and laid them to sleep. I used to invent innocent games for you. And when I was ill and I knew I wasn't thinking straight, I begged my mother to hold you, to keep you safe. Like her arms were my arms loving you. I knew I shouldn't hold you. I knew. I love the idea that a girl fetus has got all her eggs inside her as she's developing the womb. So in a sense, we carry our grandchildren with us in pregnancy. The sweet pea instructions. Place in a propagator. Do not exclude light. Over winter, indoor sowing plants <coughs> in cooler conditions, such as a cold frame. This is all far too much. I sow wildflowers instead. My hand scrawled notes promise red campion, moon daisy, eglantine and poppy. Half a week and I have 40 seedlings. My mother has to cross off another one of her nine siblings in her address book. We're all falling like dominoes, she says. She who carried me and in a sense my son, the tiny promise of him below the surface like a sprouting root. I fold down her sweet pea packet, saving them for her. <clears throat> um, yeah, the experience of illness and then recovery was quite a lonely place for me, but um, 
love and support from a few friends made a, a huge difference. This is the friendship prescription. After wandering around A and E, before falling into a grandma's seizure, I prescribed myself somebody to listen. In the absence of campfire and blankets, someone would huddle inside the tent of curtains, perched on my rickety metal bed. And though this wasn't part of the hospital offering, since then I have been listened to, held, till there's no more of them but all us. A crocheted blanket around taut shoulders, lips to the baby's warm fontanelles, the white moon shifting on its anchor. My penultimate poem is a strange sort of bricked in column and it's addressed to Mother Julian, who is the 13th century Norwich mystic who had herself bricked into a cell on the side of the church. She was an anchorite and she's known for, for her writing, especially um, all should be well and all should be well and all manner of things should be well. Intercession. Oh, Mother Julian, you had the good sense to invite your sickness. Mine snuck up on me. You shared Christ visions. Your rude and your hazelnut. I dreamt with eyes open, all incense and parsley leaf, etching fire symbols onto the night sky. You chose the walls of your anchor hold, but I had my own confinement. Your goddess is a mother continuously carrying us. In her womb, we are remade, our lives knit together from frayed odds and ends. I have never seen who it was made me. I light this candle in the name of my child, salvaged by love. The walls will not hold. Please, mother, pray for us. Um, just say thank you again for having me um, here this evening for listening to the work. I'm going to finish on a, a really tiny poem. It's called The Book of Thank You. I cupped my hands. The petals fell into them lightly. I opened my lips. The tune emerged like a freed wren. It was warm in the park and the magnolias were candelabra. Thank you so much. Gosh, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, so um, really kind of what um, very powerful and moving, um, very um, just kind of very bold visions of um, someone's mind into someone's mind. And um, I just think like um, it's, yeah, it just makes us wonder about like the permission to write, you know, like what can we actually express uh, through um, through these uh, words, articulation, silences, and how do you kind of balance all these, um, or how do you portray all these identities in oneself? Um, thank you so much, and uh, be, be sure to, um, if you haven't got um, a card back yet, uh, make sure you've got a copy to, to read it and um, discover, you know, some of the poems and look forward to the new ones. Um, so our, we'll move on to the um, to also Anieszka's um, reading. Um, so Anieszka uh, Stusinska, and um, um, she's uh, her wonderful collection Snow Calling was um, back then shortlisted for the London New Poetry Award. Um, and her second collection, What Things Are, was published by I Wear as well. Her most recent collection is called Branches of a House by Shearsman, um, just recently launched. And so we're really, uh, really looking forward to, um, to listening more to, to, um, to your work tonight. She has pub pu published poems in various magazines, including Long Poem Magazine, Butcher's Dog, Finnish Creatures Mag, Manhattan Review, and many others. And she teaches for the poetry school um, as well as elsewhere. Um, so, and I think she, she didn't mention, but I think Anieszka is doing her uh, PhD in creative writing at Royal Holloway. And uh, so maybe you can tell more, <laughs> us more about your PhD poems and all that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, could I just say, well, thank you um, to, uh, to Jen and Jenny and Yvette uh, tonight. And it, it, I've just been transported to, to so many amazing places. And what I love about evenings like that is that there actually is so much um, 
shared experience and continuity in, in, in the works that we've been reading. And uh, it's, full of, it's full of silences and hauntings and ghosts and homes. And uh, it's just, it's, it feels like a wonderful collaboration. Um, so, uh, and thank you, Jenny, for asking me to read. Um, so tonight I'm going to read from, like Jenny said, from Branches of a House, which has just come out with um, Shearsman Books. And um, then the first poem I'm going to read is called Voice. Um, in fact, what I, I'm, what I might do is just share my screen for a couple of, um, for two or three of the poems, um, because I guess the beauty of Zoom is that uh, you can actually sometimes see the work and some people quite like that and some people don't. Um, can, it, can everybody see that, uh, the, the voice? Can, can you see, can you see that? Yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, it's only three poems and then I'll, and then I'll just stop sharing. And voice feel, feels very fitting really, just to start off with, just because I think it, um, uh, you know, it, it welcomes and celebrates, you know, all voices. Um, and, uh, but especially in this poem, I think it tries to capture those lost voices and war torn voice, war-torn voices that don't get heard and get lost. And, um, and I wanted to try to um, capture a little bit of that. So it's called Voice. A voice lies buried in a river, driving its long skeletal frame across spliced boundaries, hidden in the vellum of summer, deep in this tissue and crust. Under the pious fires of a city, standing half full of visible darkness or light or neither. This place, a paper mache model collapsing into plated grey of printed walls, fresco bulleted, dappled with blood and graffiti. Voice crawls in the pinholes and dust of their standing. Maybe voice is our grit in the low hum of a mid-afternoon adapting the broken harmonica in rubble. Voice wraps this rutted earth in chords and layers of other inaudible voices, the scintilla of the invisible sound, tongues curling in many attempts. Once it smelt of cooking oil, bread, crushed dates, white jasmine, the blossom of anguish and apples the flannel orange of your pyjamas. Um, the next poem uh, I'm going to read is called Blue and it is um, and that it was published in um, the Butcher's Dog magazine, um, so I'm forever grateful. And it is my take on all the blue things in the world. Um, blue. Blue is a slipped silence, a silence speaking. A figure visible then vanished. A slant in perception, contradictory, indifferent. A body in water, the water of scattered light, the turquoise of toxins, this lake detained. Surfacing from the pretext, a body inside another body, the stammer of pleasure, essence, called love or soul, ink on skin. Blue is the branded, brushed history, apology, an unfurling mind, curfews of church bells, Mountains laced with footprints, oil on fingernails, oil on weapons, demolished homes, bruised walls, bricks, air between language and implication, flickering minutes of dawn, ghosts in a house, the left behind, their confession, 
the bluebell fence of borderlines and beatings, a child shout from the camp. Blue is their tongue, their mother, turning heads, error. The dinghy mottling the sea with frigid weight, swimming, caged water. Blue is the silk of a blouse. Blue is the waiting. Blue is what remains. Um, so as uh, Jenny probably said, um, Branches of a House um, explores a landscape of home and ancestry. And a lot of my work um, explore um, uh, in very similar veins to, to the other poets, the idea of uh, displacement and, and, and language and, and uh, homes and one's origins. And um, this poem, um, and it's the last one I'm going to share on screen, it's, it's called Stool, which, is, uh, which means table in Polish. Um, uh, because as you probably have, might have guessed by my name, I, I was born in Poland and I came over when I was seven. And so Poland is just this sort of, kind of like a haunted country for me in, in, in many ways. Um, and, uh, and this uh, poem tries to create uh, this sort of a, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, but also an imaginary table of, of, of um, a, a, lo a lost homeland, really. Stool. This table of wetlands and fields, of carp, borscht, pierogi, of birch forests, their boned dignity, pastures of, tea stains in oilcloth, and solitary birds in shrubs of material, the sky white and almost painless. I walk this table empty of what you cook and what you say in a language rendered and crumbled on my tongue and vanishing. A stirring of spoons, forks digging, the scrape of this cutlery widening our rivers and salted lakes, rings of tomatoes and family codes in a marsh of sound as we swallow matter and matriarchy and sugared blackberries, drink village wars. Homemade struggles lace themselves in napkins like small tapestries of woven food and women and wood and their men in territories far from our hunger. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, is that okay? Uh, the, the, the poems are gone, yes? <laughs> uh, so the, the, we're going to sort of enter, we're going to enter the house and, um, and we're going to enter the house through the brick. And um, so, so the next poem is, uh, is called Brick and it, um, and wonderfully it talks, um, it talks of, of our, you know, the, the, the you in this poem is the grandma. Um, and, you know, and I heard so many grandmas in everybody else's, um, the presence of everybody else's grandmas. And it was just, it, um, it was just beautiful. Um, but at the same time, the you could be um, anyone who is kind of haunted in a house. And by that, I don't necessarily mean them as actual ghosts, but the, 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 the memories of, of, of the yous in, in, in the brick, um, in the brick of a house. So this is called brick. Irregular palettes of colour stung yellow, mustard brown, buried shades of white. Umberlining scabrous to the soft fingers of a child who traces its exterior as he learns to walk in a house. It is as if the brick moves through him 
or we through the brick, the house changing in registers of light. Far away, another house rehearses ghost language and dance, interprets the seasons of snow spoken winters, spring shadowed with unsent letters, summers sated, sorry, summers sated with rain and autumn from its fleeting blush. There are bricks wherever we look and fallen branches and families rewriting their versions of what they were told. There are ghost houses in every village and houses in every ghost as it enters through an open window of that distant dwelling while you bury yourself deeper inside it. You too move through these bricks, the blue wind cooling your almost blue face whilst you listen to conversations cobwebbed in unlikely corners. In sleep, you scan all the occupations and childhoods and weddings, perceive bodies that once lived inside you, smell their small hands stretching towards futures in and away from the structure. You welcome these waxy flashes, loneliness, writes its own. On these walls where photographs hang flattened by daylight and error. You welcome their supple illusions, the wisp and sail of their flux, in which you are spun and swaddled and taken back to where you began. The wind in petal, rising ash, and the brick now, coated by cheap paint, floorboards tiled, stories cloaked in this notebook of home as we ghost linger in these irregular palettes of colour, stung yellow, mustard brown, buried shades, breath building bricks in preparation for a house to be that house again. Um, and so as we, as we move through the house, um, we, we, we move to an attic, um, but it is the attic of a very different house. And, um, and, and, and this poem, as basically it sort of arose as poems do, <laughs> it sort of percolates at the back of your mind. And then we were ha actually having some building done in our house and uh, upstairs in the attic and it just you know and it just kind of you know you just feel the all the shaking and the and the basically the the instability and fragility of of, of, of this solid structure really um and uh and so I started thinking and then obviously I was also inspired by um uh the poet May May uh, Bersenbrugger who's an Asian American poet and whose work I'm um looking at in my PhD and uh, particularly in her collection called Nest and um, and the epigraph at the beginning of this poem um, says my origin is a linguistic surface like a decorated wall and I sort of love it I love that line I don't quite know what it means but I love it <laughs> um, Attic the cutting of the white rosebush is sent by post. Roots like a spider's caticular hairs navigating away in this sensory field of plant, source, descent. Upstairs, the builders pull apart the attic. Brick from wall, joint from hinge, screw from wood, substance from structure. The morning mislaid in segments, glimmer and dust. Like a waking dream from a precipice, I refuse to jump. Downstairs, sounds lean on interruptions. Light unstable in these lines of keeping and remove. What is the drift of silence? Where 
is the willful murmur of our origins, I ask M the next day. Outside, the rose remains in a bucket. Roots absorb all the cool, cold water. Inside, the noise of things falling in their inconsistent, shattered way lament as they stake themselves to our forms where definitions hedge the living we once inhabited. Um, and the next poem is called Port and it was a um, it was a commission actually from um, the Essex Book um, Festival actually uh, back in 2018 and I was asked to write a response or interpret my own version of the opening of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. <laughs> <It's> like, okay, <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll go with that. Um, so I just, you know, like where, where does one begin? But I guess one began by, you know, the fact was that I focused just on the opening and the, um, and the Tilbury docks. And that's where this is kind of based around, or it begins there. But um, but fundamentally, it just it actually it, it tries to say so much more um, and uh, about um, uh, uh, all the lost homes and social uh, movements and migrations and basically the desperation of um, people wanting safety and um, and and you know wanting a place in which they, they can feel um, that they belong um, and feel safe in, as well as, um, as well as many other things, but all the things that are right and wrong with the world, really. Um, and it, the, it, it, it's sort of, I think it's the only poem that I've sort of tried to, it's not a performance poem by any means, but I've tried to uh, kind of uh, get the urgency um, towards as, as the poem builds of of of, of how um, uh, I guess how urgent you know the, the desperation of of um, social and economic migration is, and in fact any migration really. Um, there is an epigraph by Joseph Conrad at the beginning of this poem that says one ship is very much like another and the sea is always the same. Port. In May, unsullied clouds haul across a sky, uh, sorry, I'll start again. In May, unsullied clouds haul across a sky dotted with seabirds. I point towards them. My children eat their snacks, staring at the wry, moss-grey waters of the Thames. It stretches and turns as if a colony of human hands were pulling it out of its skin. Poached identities flicker on the water's rim as the sun anchors in the ditches of marshland. We are here on this coastal path against the shadows of a town redundant. Ghostly diligence folds in disused buildings. The lines of the river scribble the language of her dark intentions. Late afternoon approaches. I point to the map and ask if we are to head further. The children say no. I point in the direction of Tilbury docks, past the pylons, cranes, the wind turbines scathing the air for energy, a tableau of industry in which we are the only humans. I point to the map and show them the docks. It looks like a bent fork, my son replies. Gulls above fly like undelivered parcels. Their weight dents the sky as they cargo inside its grip. They are migratory, I say. 
my daughter asks what this means. To travel from one country or climate to another. Fish and animals do this, I reply. We are animals, my son says, and I nod, yes, people too, pointing to their sweet wrappers held in their hands like tickets. I Google goals. The herring gull appears on the page. The sentence, seabirds have always proven elusive subjects to study, glare on the screen. I'm surprised at how many species there are and how difficult it is to identify them. They are described on one site as intelligent and adaptable. I think of the latter. The skill and perseverance of this undertaking to readjust. Are you listening? I look up. We are hungry, the children announce. I point to the docks again. Look at the fork. It is, it is a port on the River Thames. It's very old, I say, and I try to count from 1886. A port is, I begin, a place of arrival and departure. I try to explain words like fright, struggle and shipment how the things we like or use are transported and there are these boxes on board these ships called containers and inside them they heard the banging and inside them they heard the banging the dehydrated screaming of children and women 35 voices squashed in their own desperation inside this steel promise for something better and no, one ship is not very much like another. This one imported one dead man, eight men, remained eight women and 13 children between one and 12. I am trying not to imagine those children, the smell of fear or want even, not imagine what happened before or after or during this journey, their skins encased, waiting to be eaten. Imagine not if they were sent back to the country or the outcome of the criminal investigation or how unequal and arbitrary living becomes. Just like last week, stopping at the red light in my car, I saw a woman squatting against a shop wall. I tried not to look, but we seize the other in the lacework of passing. I tried not to imagine the thing she had lost, now wavering between the fog of exhaust fumes, these cars and us. I thought of the man on the YouTube video filming the back of a lorry in his own lorry near Calais. How the men came out from nowhere, how they thumped on the door, how they managed to open the back, how the man filming the lorry was tutting, how the man filming the lorry ignored the hand blows on his own door as he shouted, get a passport. I tried not to imagine. I tried not to imagine what was inside his head. I tried not to imagine this urgent, frantic possibility of a leaving, of resigning identity, of the cool compliance of the sea shouldering bodies, my own mothering body now notched like the imperfect, perfect apples I eat, as if tasting myself through their flushed red, yellow green peel, packaged in plastic on which reads wonky apples. I eat their wonkiness. I recycle the wrapping. What of protection, I think, and convenience and price and the plastic that blossoms in the urban loam and the plastic ducks and toys bobbing out to sea. But of this damage, you know already, this world signified in sign, pointing to itself or elsewhere, beyond culture to a place of no language or light in the black bank of cloud 
where hearts indeed grow darker, the earth smaller, and the ocean crowded with impermeable secrets. In pointing to the poor, in, in pointing to the fork, I pause and say nothing of all this. I change route. Shall we take the ferry across? Like fishermen, sea captains, pirates, stowaways, following the river as it opens to the sea. It's been a while since I've actually read that. <laughs> um, uh, and I think we've got time for just for one more, just to end it. Um, as we're about to leave autumn and go into winter, um, uh, I shall read my, um, the last days of autumn, I guess. I think we are still officially in autumn, aren't we? <laughs> um, so this is my, um, autumn poem, autumn. I've, I've done a sort of serious autumn, spring, winter, but. Autumn. Driftwood white of sky, barely touching the stratagem of fallen leaves, the puffer of reds and oranges, undersides folding, unanswerable, unrequited. I step on the torment a network of rusted blades and measureless tails. I walk to unsettle their orderless piles and then in the woods relent, forage every, forage every stipule, every verb, every crossroad of a silent colour. I drape among branches, hear bicycle wheel flank tracks, shapeless sounds of girls giggle, call out their scent to nameless boys and the awkward beauty of their shouting shedding itself in that first kiss against the ridges of bark. Hands blinded by breath, scale to scale in mimicry of nature. We are mashed in this patina of collapsed desire and desire budding, tremor of leaf play, the skein of geese in a shrilled chorus of flight. Underfoot, the tips of a crocus splintered. And I think that's, then that, yeah, I think, I think we can conclude it there for now until. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anyashka. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. Wonderful. Um, just really, um, Kind of uh, powerful poems and um, just such a range of um, landscapes and nostalgia and uh, witnessing in your poems and um, just um, you know really expansive themes as well and um, stories behind. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got I posted the link uh, for everyone oh. to make sure that they know about the yeah where to go for <laughs> getting a copy. And um, so. Um, thank you to all our four poets tonight and, um, you know, like um, just such a, a lovely range of voices and, um, and at the same time, all these connections that are between uh, your works as well. So why don't we just um, see if anyone has some questions for you, um, please feel free to leave them in the chat or, or if you want to um, unmute and, you know, maybe give us a signal or just simply unmute and, you know, bring us the question. That would be wonderful. And I think, you know, Sue has already very <laughs> speedily come up with a very intelligent question. Um, Sue, would you, um, should I read it out loud or would you like to? Um, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, shall I, shall yeah, I read? Please. <laughs> So um, I'm just reading from the chat. So if, if it doesn't make sense, it is in the chat. Um, I was really interested in um, Yvette Sento and how she brought all those different voices and influences um, and braided them together. And I was just wondering um, whether you could all maybe comment on your influences and how you bring them into your work, whether they're kind of visible or invisible, I suppose was my question. That's a good question. 
Yvette? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic question. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm just thinking about braiding, which I, I'm, I'm still struck by the way that all our voices braided together in these yeah. things, grandmothers and displacements and uh, truly very moving. And I, I'm sort of lost my words, but I can, I consider myself a Latin American poet. I, I was brought up in the US and in Mexico and I came of age in the American educational system before coming to <laughs> the UK but I'm always wrestling between um, different literary traditions. And for me, the, the voices that really uh, operate at a more visceral level are the voices of Latin American poetry. But I think there's a kind of alchemy that happens. I mean, listening to Jenny's, uh, Jenny Pagan's poems this evening, I was really struck by something, which is that her, her, she was thinking of with Julian of Norwich, whom I've been reading this month. And reading her along, I think there's a way in which we're drawn to things to read in a very mystical way sometimes, for lack of a better word, that I don't know why I've been reading this, this, this week, this month, but I'm obsessed with it and f find myself drawn to scholarship. Right now I'm reading uh, Gabriele Schwab's uh, book, Haunted Legacies, which is about transgenerational trauma and which deals with this idea of uh, of Abraham and Torek's idea of the crypt as a site of silences and trauma. And so thinking about the crypt in, in that theoretical framework, <laughs> the internment of, a, of an anchoress in, um, in Norwich in the 15th century, 14th century, is kind of a non sequitur, but there's a way in which the poetic mind kind of finds tissues between things and then something wonderful happens and that thing is a poem. That's my answer. Oh, that, was, yeah, that was an amazing answer. Um, yeah. I'd follow that. But it was just really interesting listening to you because um, when you mentioned Abraham and Torek and, uh, you know, because I've been doing a lot of work on uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Jacques Derrida's notion of hauntology. It builds on that, yeah. Yeah, pardon? Which builds on them. Yes, yes, it does. It does build and he sort of departs from it, doesn't he? But, and, uh, and, and that's been kind of influencing my, um, I guess kind of maybe my themes and my sort of relationship to visibility and invisibility and, and kind of <coughs> ideas of belonging. And, and so sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes, and maybe because I am at the moment in the field work of academia, but that, that hasn't always been the case. It does, um, it, it, it plays a really interesting relationship to your creative practice. So, I, you know, from, from a sort of a scholarly point of view, you know, I, I think Derrida's voice you know, um, has influenced my sort of recent thinking more than writing. Um, but then, uh, 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 but you know, and voices change, don't they? And, um, and uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and sometimes I'm, I'm very much like a, you know, a magpie, you know, you get attracted to, to, to so many things that you sometimes you, you lose your own sort of um, um, uh, a place in the world or place in the sort of the, the worldly world um, but sometimes you know when I do that I'm you know I think you know primarily I think I'm a sort of a lyrical poet and and I actually uh, when I do lose myself I actually go back to the works of um, Jory Graham that mm. would be um, like the early her early stuff um, that would be my sort of and you know and again Caroline Forche um, some of her you know her earlier work well um they're the things that i sort of come back to but um yeah thank you that's my jenny jennifer see you on today i find it really engaging question as well and, and i think i would probably say i find my own influences to be more invisible in my work i think i'm so awed by the poets whose work I admire, I can't claim an inheritance from them. It feels too much. So um, there's just uh, there's a there's a whole set of contemporary poets, especially women whose work resonates with me all the time. And I'm sure I'm taking something from them, but I can't point at it and find the exact you know influence lines or poems. Um, and I've said 
I think that they're largely women. I have sort of guilt for the number of women that I read outweighing the number of men that I'm reading so much in recent years. And, and often not always the men whose work I'm picking up are LGBTQI+. Plus. Um, that seems to be another like another way in which my reading is is lacking diversity so I'm really interested to hear people's book recommendations during this during this session but um yeah it's um no it's just I th I think I see it as invisible I there, there are huge huge number of people like I mean I could list a really long list but People like Melissa Lee Horton, Fiona Benson, Rebecca Goss, Sharon Olds, Kim Adonizio, Marilyn Hacker, Anne Carson, all these poets are somewhere echoing around in my mind and are so important and so precious to me. Um, maybe it's someone else's work to tell me. <laughs> and this is how they've, you know, how, how you've particularly carried something forward from, from their poetry. Um, Lovely. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. Lovely mention of these poets. Um, they are all really good poets' work. Thank you. And how about uh, Jennifer? Jennifer? Jenny? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We've got lots of Jenny here. Jenny, you <laughs> time. Um, yeah, thank you so much um, for that question. It, it is a really interesting one. Um, I think for me, um, I suppose right now, I would say that, you know, what comes to mind for me is that you know, I think the mind is quite a mysterious entity. So, um, you know, I suppose in terms of influences, I mean, I think sometimes things that I'm influenced by um, might be sort of Im implicit um, and you know, sometimes unconscious um, and other times um, perhaps more explicit. So I think it probably depends on what type of writing I'm doing. Um, so I think, for example, um, with my pamphlet Kismet, um, I guess I was more influenced by um, you know, the English lyric tradition in a lot of ways. Um, but I feel as though I'm in a kind of transitional kind of period at the moment. Um, so I've been reading a lot more um, experimental um, poetry. So you know, writers like Barnu Kapil, um, Maybe Bersenbrugger, who Agnieszka mentioned. Um, I also really love Valgina Mort's most recent collection, um, and in fact all of her work. Um, and I've been working on a lyric essay for, for quite some time now, which engages with a lot of French feminist theory, um, mm. which has been a huge inspiration to me um, for you know, a very long time. So, um, you know, French um, theorists like, you know, Sikhsu, Yes. Um, Irigaray, mm -hmm. and Christeva, and Catherine Clement. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really interested in theory. I find that kind of stimulates my my mind in a way, um, which hopefully I'd like to bring to poetry. Um, so yeah, so that's where I'm at at the moment. Really lovely. I think I can also see how these theories inform you. Um, you know, inform your work, and um, and I think, <coughs> sorry, I'm not feeling very well um, lately. Um, so Fiona has another question as well. Would you like to? Would you like to ask? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, it's I, I put it in the chat, but um, it's it's about um, um, there's a lot of sense of inheritance and nostalgia and the sense of a lost land behind lots of the work which we've heard um, this evening. And uh, um, certainly um, from my own perspective, that, that involves kind of some religious language. And I was interested in whether um, that kind of sense of faith has come, has come through, not so much a sense of faith, but more sort of linguistically how, that's, how that affects poets' work. Because I think that what you remember from childhood can be embedded in a, in, a, in a different language or in a different culture, perhaps from what you are now, are now pursuing. And uh, yeah, it's another question about influence, I guess. Hmm. Anyone would like to address that first? Uh, 
Yeah, it's just gonna, it, it, it's interesting that that actually just when you were saying that, Fiona, I was just thinking about yeah, this idea of faith, and uh, you were talking, you know, you you know, you were sort of talking about your own sort of um, influences of religion being quite a, an important aspect in your upbringing, and and it probably again comes out in your writing somehow, mm -hmm. um, or, or something that you return to, you know, it's what I sort of call these like uh, haunting narratives. Uh -huh. haunting Say that like we we I you know I truly believe that we are quite haunted by certain narratives that just don't leave us and we kind of explore them just in different ways and I've sort of found that 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 has been happening to to, to my work um, and you, you just you, but you're just doing it maybe from a different perspective or from a different angle or in a different voice or and so yeah it's interesting you should say um, you should sort of talk about religion because I hadn't really thought of about the faith and the, you know, from that sort of inheritance, but at fundamentally, you know, my grandmother was a very um, uh, devout Catholic mm -hmm. and uh, uh, to the point that, you know, um, it was, uh, which, you know, on reflection now I could kind of, you know, I saw the sort of the beauty of it and the faith it gave her, but at the time, obviously it was quite um, <laughs> uh, stifling, um, but, uh, yeah, and but 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 weirdly enough, her, you know that sort of that sort of invisible, because uh, I guess that her relationship with religion was you know very visible to her. But it was kind of maybe you know the, the older I grow <laughs> or turn, I can I can sort of um, begin to relate to this idea of faith of having something to hold on to, um, and uh, and uh, and and maybe uh, yeah, it, it may well manifests itself in, in in different ways in 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 what I write but uh, yes um, I do think we certainly certainly have our own narratives that we we keep returning to mm -hmm. I don't think that really answers your question but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it does it does sure anyone would like to add to be um, honest I mean, it's such a, a, an incredibly vast question and a wonderful one, Fiona. I, I, it, it makes me think about my work and my life. I'm having this soul searching moment here, but you know, I grew up in a very conservative uh, evangelical Protestant Christian family. I was the church pianist. I would, so the idea, and it was in Spanish. And so the idea, not so much of a liturgy, but of a way of constantly wrestling with biblical story, biblical language, is something that I have deeply ingrained since childhood. And I, I used to interpret sermons spontaneously when I was little, because I was the only one who spoke English fluently in my family, at, 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 or my larger family at one point. And so I think those kinds of ways of wrestling with or engaging with biblical language mm -hmm. shape like anything else you read, the, the lexical choices and textures of, of, the, of the work that we make as poets. And, from in my own family, there, there was a great emphasis amongst several of my aunts and uncles on divine revelation, going back to Julian of Norwich. Uh, my uncle used to have these intense visions and dreams. And so there was a way in which faith and story and uh, mystery and family trauma were all very thickly interrelated uh, and I think it made me a translator and translation for me is a kind of apprenticeship into poetry so I I think about grandmothers my grandmother was a Catholic who converted to Protestant Christianity in midlife my other grandmother was very performatively Catholic but was crypto Jewish <laughs> and and those things those silences come up in my work much more often than I, as a person who left a kind of religious education in favor of a, sexual, a secular university life, that, that I sometimes outwardly reject, but inwardly still uh, respond to on a very visceral level. Um. Yes, thank you. thank you very much, Yvette, um, for your answer. Um, I was also wondering um, if there is um, 
way, I mean, uh, kind of building on to Fiona's question, um, like there's, there's like all in all of your works, like there is um, in a way some political views or some ways of um, engaging with or um, resisting what, um, you know, like the stereotypes or resisting what is um, what people usually think of um, women's roles and in a way you kind of um, articulate a lot more of um, the dimensions that people don't usually um, realize about um, being a woman. Um, do you do you have feelings about like how you know what is the most difficult or challenging to write about or in your work and and how do you kind of find ways to you know find a way to have a breakthrough in terms of language or in terms of your own poetics? Yeah, I don't. I, I find I find it very very difficult writing about. Um, yeah, the world at large, you know, and, and, and sort of, you know, what somebody might call political poems or, you know, reflections um, on, on, on society and, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the world at large and what goes on really. And, and I really want to, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like, you know, there's this something that, that, that I strongly feel I would like to explore more but I do find it very hard to think of a, a you know, a good way in or a way mm -hmm. in um, and how, um, and kind of my response, you know, how I, I do that responsibly without it sounding, you know, like a cliche or another, you know, it's, I think, um, yeah, that's something I would like to explore more, um, but I, I do actually find it very difficult to, um, articulate that experience and how to make it and it's very you know I think also yeah, sometimes I sometimes I feel you know, even uncomfortable about being classified as a poet because you just think oh god <laughs> um you know what can I really do and oh look here I am sitting in my you know nice house writing about you know the, or trying to write about an experience that you know, I haven't necessarily had, you know, uh, you know, a, 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 an encounter with necessarily, de depending on the experience, um, but you, but you want to engage with it, you, you want to kind of, you know, you're witnessing it in a different way. And so it, you know, it's a question of how does that one do that? And I'm, unfortunately, I'm still, you know, pondering on that. Um, <laughs> Mm. And you know, and port was. I mean, port. I think is as close as, as I've ever got to something like that, really. Um, and that was just because you know it felt. It, you know, I had to do something because it was a commission, so it forced me to really think about it. And then there was a structure, there was a framework, and so maybe you know, and then and then there was you know, and, and fundamentally that there was personal, you know. Um, a, you know a personal narrative so I, I feel like I always have to have some kind of a personal narrative in order to be able to write about the greater mm. um, personal yeah that's right poor pot is very moving thank you it's just so immense a subject and yet you kind of brings us in to to understand the East people's stories um any other comments I think uh, for me Hi, you <laughs> Hello, I think for me, um, the, the question that you asked was about women writing as a poet who is a woman and the ways that uh, we might want to comment politically from our position as women. And I think for me, that's, I'm sure the more recent poems are beginning to have a little more of a feminist stance, I suppose, but I think the, the poems in the Snow Globe and Callback, which are the majority of what I've written, probably, or published, certainly, are um, my female identity is kind of subsumed by this illness that it's oh, sort of overtook anything else. And so, um, obviously, I had an illness that could only happen to women, but very similar things occur for men as well. And reclaiming an identity out of that position um, of stigma and all, 
and the rest of it was work that I had to do for quite a while that sort of overtook other concerns. So I suppose there are poems in the collection that I, I would say I'm not a political poet, really, but there are poems that um, do some of that work. And uh, there are also poems that are less um, angry and more moving towards recovery. And in that process, I think the kind of recovery that I wrote and did was, was a very um, feminine or female one, um, perhaps to, I don't know, but perhaps in, in conversation with um, historical women like, um, like like the, the the references to Julian of Norwich, um, and like um, conversations that I have in some well not conversations but interactions with um, artists in some of the poems, um, I think the 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 way of the mode of address for political is is very um, is very soft and very indirect. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you, Jenny. I, 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 I've made jokes in the chat this evening about grandmother open mic and grandmother poems, but, <laughs> but I, I mean that in all seriousness that I come from a Latin American tradition where poets can be very political and it's very much part of the poetic discourse, and whether it's lyric poetry or, or not. Um, mm. I write many of my poems for my grandmother, and that's a very difficult thing to explain, but I will do so succinctly in that my grandmother was a woman born in 1909 in rural El Salvador. She was the eldest of five women. She was supposed to be a boy. So because she wasn't, she was given the name of a boy. Her name was Luke the Evangelist. And she never learned to read. She was always the one taking care of the household. And I think I live in this very rarefied academic world. And I, I have access to, to books that she never had. But I also know that my love of books, my love of knowledge comes from her. And so the way that she uh, wrestled and engaged with the world, her way of, of inquiry is deeply was always deeply personal, but also deeply political. And so the conversations I can have through her, with her through my poems, always, even when the subject is not uh, overtly political, is in fact a political statement. And it, I think she gives me voice to something that I, that I could not access otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jennifer, Jen Jennifer, Lisa, do you want to? add anything to um yeah sure um i mean i think that um yeah what Yvette, jenny and agnieszka have all um commented and shared you know really resonates and you know for me the personal is political um and i guess um just going back to the question that you asked jenny about um identity and how you know women can sort of speak to that and express that through their poetry, then um, I guess from from my own point of view, um, as a second generation, you know, British born, Chinese, um, cisgendered woman, then um, I guess that I'm trying to, um, yeah, in many ways sort of create and assert a space where um, my voice can, can come across. Um, and yeah, I loved Fiona's question about faith and language. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm interested in spirituality, I guess, and you know, what that means, um, seeking to, to define it. Um, and I suppose, um, yeah, just going back to the French feminists, um, you know, I, I guess I interrogate notions of spirituality and you know, mystical religious discourse and um, through them at the moment. So, you know, primarily through the rigorized work, you know, which I really love, um, but also 
just going back to Chris Daver again, um, I guess I'm trying to critique in a lot of ways um, what what these um, yet yeah, so-called French feminists are philosophizing and theorizing about, um, and to yet yeah, challenge certain things that they're saying from their particular perspective. So it's yeah, in a way to enter into dialogue with them, you know, conversation. I find really amazing is like the fluidity and the permission that all of you have as writers to sort of um, kind of break into new areas or, or inhabit new spaces as I think all of you have kind of different ways of, you know, discovering yourself or rediscovering um, womanhood, um, like through the, uh, the kind of like um, French feminists, as um, um, Jennifer said, and or translation or family stories and, um, you know, language and metaphors. And I just think like there are just so many ways to to make it new, isn't it? And um, I'm really struck by the kind of texture and depth of all these um, poems. Um, I, I'm quite aware that we've got you, we've uh, we've gone on for quite a while. So um, how about if we also invite um, all, uh, the, our future poets to share some reading, or um, if, if possible, um, with us and like their latest recommends and kind of enrich our put it on our reading list. <laughs> <laughs> I just. Yes. Did you? Just, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. What am I reading? Um, oh gosh. Yeah. I, I was, would you, would you, I'm uh, actually. Do you know? I, my head's probably more um, engaged in, in lots of sort of academic. Your PhD. <laughs> yeah. It's just, no actually, the one. Uh, but but we. I mean, I tell you what. I have found absolutely um, energizing is this is this amazing conversation about sort of French feminist theory, which mm -hmm. I ended up. Um, looking into quite a lot years ago, actually, for my for my BA, and I've always loved um, uh, mm -hmm. Helena Sixty's work. And it's so funny that that you should say that you're you're just you were reading uh, Three Steps to the, Led, um, to the Ladder Writing because I've got it on my desk somewhere in the piles of rubbish because I was just <laughs> looking at it earlier on, actually. Um, so that um, I guess yeah, I've you know I've been yeah I've been reading a little bit of that and uh, and just boring detail stuff. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so um, although in relation to poetry I have bought this brilliant um that the you know that the the craft uh probably yes, that book. Yeah. have you did you buy? I actually bought this the other day I just thought oh you know um just shut it on zoom sorry yeah uh, uh, edited by Rishi is it Dastida I don't know quite how to pronounce his name that's right Dastid Dust, dusted up. Anyway, so that I, I've I've been dipping into that. Um, wow, yeah. gorgeous! Thank you so much. And uh, <laughs> Yvette, would you have? Any? I just shouted on Zoom. I'm so sorry. My enthusiasm for that book has no bounds. Um, I mentioned. I mean, I have. I think a lot. There's a lot to be said for the books that I use to prop up my computer during a Zoom, yeah. not for the proper chin level. Uh, and on my Underneath my computer, I had the book I mentioned, Haunting Legacies, Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma by Gabriela Schwab, who's a, a scholar at UC Irvine. And uh, right now I'm reading everything I can get my hands on by the, the Canadian writer uh, Dion Brandt, uh, especially The Blue Clerk, which is a kind of Ars Poetica of sorts. It's it's a very difficult to categorize type of book. It's like prose poems. Oh like, my God, this is like it. It's, it's a marvelous book recommended by a dear friend and it's, I think, changing my life. So between that and Julian of Norwich, I've got my hand, hands and head full. Can I can I just, um, just give you a recommendation? Have you heard of Avery Gordon, Ghostly Matters? I have my my supervisor here is a is a is a specialist on ghosts and the spectral. Oh my! Uh, we need we need to chat, <laughs> right? So yeah, I, I would have thought you'd really enjoy that book, Avery uh, Avery Gordon's Ghostly Matters. Classic, yeah, yeah. Oh, where we go? 
Jenny, Jennifer, Lee Tai, or Jenny Pectin. Um, yeah, I, the most recent poetry book I finished was this, um, Soho by Richard Scott. Yeah. It's an amazing book. It's, yeah, it's so, so what would I say? It, you, I felt like I was in conversation with him, you know, that I'd met him. It was, it was so, such a close read, really, really strong. And um, I, I was, I'm slightly cheating. These aren't necessarily the books that I'm reading right this second, but this evening I was going to pick out books that had really, that I've read recently. And this isn't a recent read, but it's so astonishing that I just, I had to bring it along. What the Living Do mm -hmm. by Marie Howe. Amazing, absolutely love her work. Um, and, an, and another one that's touched me a lot this year is um, My Darling from the Lion by Rachel Long. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess say I'm going to switch it. Wonderful. Um, so those, those, I mean, yeah, these books are more, but, um, but I'll, I'll make those my sort of must, you know, you cannot miss these recommendations. Oh my gosh. It feels like we have a kind of yeah. <laughs> similar book to and taste. <laughs> what a, and, uh, um, any, anything else? It's uh, Jennifer, Detai, uh, Jenny. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a, a great conversation. Um, yeah, I, I love all the recommendations that people have made. Um, yeah, there's just so much, you know, it's just where to start with it all. Um, so I've got piles of books around me. I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so just, bad. <laughs> You've got a mountain. Um, but um, recently, um, I suppose with my, you know, with my studies and with my work, then um, I like also to read prose as well for a change. So I'd really recommend um, this, which I read recently, um, Simple Passion by Annie Erno. Um, and um, it's a book which is possible to read in an evening, um, which is great you know, when you don't have that much time. And um, it's 48 pages. Yeah, so I'd really recommend that. Um, and um, yeah, also I love Mamie Bersenbruger. So I've been reading this recently, Empathy. Um, which is wonderful, yeah. Um, and this is something I've been reading recently as well. Um, it's a book of essays by Cynthia Cruz, and it's called The Melancholy of Class. Um, so I've been thinking quite a lot about melancholia in general, so this chimes in quite well with that. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend that too. Um, and yeah, I could go on, but um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for everyone, um, you know, for all your, um, you know, amazing uh, book suggestions and also your stories and, and your, above all, like your beautiful poems. And I just feel like we kind of uh, have gone into this masterclass with <laughs> Forwards. and um so um uh, i would um you know like maybe at this point wrap, wrap up and um can we go give a big applause again to um to annie Ashke, jennifer lita yvette Sitchford, and and um and, um jenny packed in uh, for your wonderful work thank you and um so um you know, like do check out their book suggestions and their own collections. And um, so we'll have this also on YouTube. And um, I hope that you are having, going to look forward to a good um, weekend as well. And, uh, you know, thanks so much for coming along. And um, we'll post up our next event uh, soon. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been Thank so moving and lovely for me. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Sue. Bye. Bye, Bye, Sue. Bye Fiona. See you soon. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Fiona. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank oh, you so much. Got to say, it's been such a superb evening. Yeah, really lovely to you. Please, please, please keep in contact. We yes. have got each other's emails, haven't we? Yes. yes. It's it's not often that uh, sometimes you just think, oh my goodness, you know, that's just, 
everything that you're saying just feels like um, 